just let me check the live chat whether it's working just give me a minute Yes, I believe I'm audible and visible. So happy evening, everyone. A very good evening. I hope and I believe all of you are doing well. So welcome to the today's YouTube live channel on the channel of Prep Lado, where this is Dr. Nikita here, your radiology faculty. And today we have FMGE flashback. That is uh, the PYQs in radiology from the FMG exam. And this is going to be useful for the NEET PG students as well, because I hope the NEET PG students are aware that you also need to have a look at the FMG EPYQs when you're preparing for NEET PG. Because as we said, the board conducting is the same. Okay? Yes. So, good evening everyone uh, 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 who are here for this session. So, let's make the best of this session and look at all the previous year questions that have been asked in the recent years. And that will help us uh, understand basically what questions are important for our upcoming exam as well. So before I even begin with the discussion of the questions, I would like to tell to each one of you here, uh, you know, all days during your preparation will not be the same. There will be days where you will feel low, you will not feel like starting, you will feel like giving up. But remember, that is the time when you should not be giving up, right? So it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. So the most important thing is... Uh, my voice is uh, breaking. Just give me a minute. So how many of you feel that there's an issue with the audio here? How uh, are you guys facing an issue with the audio here? Uh, because it seems fine at my end. Okay, that's great. So yes, what I wanted to say is, uh, please, uh, it really does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. All you need to do is be there on the ground playing the match. Because as I always say, you can always win the match till the last ball also. The match is not over. So make sure you are giving your best, even if it is Chodasa on one particular day. But make sure you are making your consistency. You are keeping your consistency. And remember that magic happens when you do not give up even though you want to. There will be many days, there will be many instances where you will feel like giving up, but that's the moment when you do not give up and you would see the magic happening. And why? Why does the magic happen then? Is because the universe always falls in love with a stubborn heart. Right? So universe also loves someone with a stubborn heart. So if you persist, the universe would also give in and you would definitely reach to your goal and you'll be able to clear your exam. So make sure you remember this that no matter what I don't have to give up and I have to give my best till the last minute. Right. So on that positive note, let's start with the discussion of the questions here. All of these as the session name itself says, this is FMG flashback. We are conducting the FMG PYQ sessions on the Prep Ladder YouTube channel for all the subjects. So make sure you are subscribed to this channel so that you do not miss on any of the sessions that we are conducting because all of these are going to be the high yield sessions. Okay? <laughs> stubborn heart means, Satyaji, stubborn heart means ziddi dil. Dil ye ziddi hai. Right? Okay. So tell me what do you think is the answer to this? What am I seeing here? Why are you answering? Many of you are answering this as a intraventricular bleed. Why do you call it intraventricular bleed? Which ventricle are you seeing here, guys? So, a 65-year-old hypertensive patient on irregular medication has headache, the blood pressure is high, and the CT head is shown. So, you can see the white bone here, and that is why this is a CT scan. This is a non-contrast CT. Why is this a non-contrast CT? Because I don't see the contrast in the sulcal spaces where the vessels are present. Now, this pathology that you see here is hyperdense. That means it is white. Okay, it is hyperdense. That means it is white. So, tell me the substances which are white or, or hyperdense or non-contrast CT. What is hyperdense on a non-contrast CT? Right. Either it is calcification, what is hyperdense or non-contrasity is calcification or acute hemorrhage. Acute hemorrhage or calcification. If the hyperdensity is as white as bones, it is calcification. Otherwise, it is uh, acute hemorrhage. Uh, Aveline Carl, please remember that infarct is hypodense. It is not hyperdense. 
So this pathology is white but not as white as the bone and that is why we have made a diagnosis that this is acute hemorrhage. Even if I am not able to, able to make a diagnosis of acute hemorrhage here, all the options tell you that this is a hemorrhage. So you don't have a confusion here ki whether this is hemorrhage or this is infarct. Anywhere all the options are saying that this is a, a hemorrhage. Now the question is where is the hemorrhage? Is it intraventricular? Let's have a look at this image. So these are the lateral ventricles, frontal horns. These are the posterior horns that we are seeing here. Right. So if I look at this image very, very carefully, I do see some hemorrhage in this left posterior horn. So there is some component of the intraventricular bleed. But the most obvious finding that I am seeing here is this large hemorrhage here, which is the hemorrhage on the left side in the region of the basal ganglia. Right. This is the basal ganglia thalamus region basically that we are seeing. So this is going to be a putaminal bleed. Okay, this is going to be putaminal bleed. So when you have both in the options, you should go with the answer of putaminal bleed. This is that small intraventricular hemorrhage that you are seeing there. Okay, that is the small intraventricular hemorrhage. But the obvious hemorrhage here is the putaminal bleed. And anyways, we also know that the most common cause of the intraparenchymal hemorrhage is hypertension. And the most common site is putamen. Okay, the most common site is putamen. And the history of hypertension is already given in this question. Right. So this is a hypertensive bleed that we are seeing here. So remember that for acute hemorrhage, the investigation of choice is non-contrast CT. For chronic hemorrhage, the investigation of choice is MRI. Can someone tell me what, in, uh, what sequence of MRI helps us in identifying the chronic hemorrhage? What sequence of MRI helps us identify the chronic hemorrhage? It is the most sensitive is the susceptibility weighted imaging. Okay, the most sensitive is SWI. DWI is for acute infarct. What is the most sensitive for acute infarct? It is DWI. Diffusion weighted imaging is for acute infarct. Okay, SWI susceptibility weighted imaging is for hemorrhage. Going on to the next question, identify the marked structure on the CT head, whether this is optic nerve, it is optic chysma, optic tract, or is it superior ophthalmic artery? Very good. That's the optic nerve because look at the image here. Is this a CT or is this a MRI? The white bone tells me that this is a CT and this part basically this is the optic nerve that we are seeing arising from the center of the globe. Right arising from the center of the globe this is the optic nerve. Can someone tell me what is this structure here if I label this structure here what is this structure? This structure is on the medial aspect of the eye. This is the medial muscle that is the medial rectus. This one here will be the lateral rectus. Medial rectus, lateral rectus. And you can see some calcification at the optic nerve head. And that calcification at the optic nerve head, this is also called as drusen. Okay, this is also called as drusen. So remember uh, that is the medial rectus and the lateral rectus muscle there. And so the answer here is this is optic nerve. And out of the box question here, compression of optic chysma leads to what visual field defect? Very, very important. It is bitemporal hemianopia. Compression of optic chysma leads to bitemporal hemianopia. Okay. Why are the muscles white? The muscles are not white here. You can see the gray component, the gray color to the muscles here. Okay. The white is the bone that you can see here. Going on to the next one, identify the marked structure shown by the arrow. Which arrow? This arrow is what we are talking about here. Identify the marked structure shown by the arrow. Is it the medulla? Is it the pons? Is it the midbrain? Or is it the spinal cord? Very good. So majority of you know this correctly. This is midbrain. Okay, this is midbrain. How do I know this is midbrain? Is by the classical shape of the midbrain here. This Mickey Mouse shape or this heart shape structure. So this is what a structure like this, which is going to have this heart shape or Mickey Mouse shape. That is the midbrain. Okay, so this is midbrain that we are seeing here. What is the orange arrow showing? 
what is the orange arrow showing there so this part is basically the part of the medial temporal lobe that is the uncus okay the uncus that is the medial temporal lobe and that is why when there is uncle herniation right the perimesencephalic space the space around the midbrain is obliterated right and then it has the presentation so remember that's a medial temporal lobe going on to the next one uh, a 45 year old male with heart disease undergoes a chest x-ray what is the diagnosis is it the prosthetic aortic wall prosthetic mitral wall pericardial calcification is it an implantable uh, pacemaker very good that is the prosthetic uh, that is the prosthetic mitral valve so where do you see the mitral valve here basically this circular white structure that you see here that is the mitral valve okay that is the location of the mitral valve so what do we do a line from this right cardiophrenic angle to the left hilum if the valve is below that then it is the mitral valve okay so you draw a line like this if the valve is below that it is the mitral valve if the valve is about the above that and more horizontal then it is the aortic valve so niche wala is the mitral valve and you have the above that is going to be the aortic valve right and these white white things that you see here if i zoom in the same these white white structures that you see here these are the sternotomy sutures that are present there so the answer to this uh, basically this is the uh, this is the prosthetic mitral valve aortic will be above that pericardial calcification will be surrounding the heart and for the pacemaker you should see the pacemaker with the lead going into the heart okay that is going to be the pacemaker right so look at this image here which is showing you that the mitral valve is below the aortic valve is above okay so that is the location of the mitral valve and the aortic valve right going on to the next question X-ray of a two-year-old child is given. What is the possible diagnosis? What is? I I see some uh, confusion here. Someone majority of you are correct answering it correctly. Yes. this is the pneumoperitoneum what sign of pneumoperitoneum are you seeing here guys what is the sign of pneumoperitoneum that you are seeing here so this black black air that you are seeing here in the entire abdomen so what is that sign called as this sign is basically the football sign correct that is the football sign any other sign that you are seeing here what is this sign called as can you appreciate these two white lines what are those two white lines telling you those two white lines are the umbilical ligament which are surrounded by air on either side and that is why they are seen so clearly because the ligament surrounded by the air on either side because of a air on either side the ligament looks very clear what is that sign called as that is the inverted v sign okay that is the inverted v sign the air surrounding the umbilical ligament So, what are the various signs in pneumoperitoneum? You have the football, the inverted V, regular sign, cupola sign, the left lateral decubitus abdomen sign is all that we have. So, remember, this is a pneumoperitoneum. What condition in the child can cause this uh, uh, pneumoperitoneum? Necrotizing enterocolitis, right? Necrotizing enterocolitis. Remember, we have the bell staging. It can lead to the gangrene of the bowel, necrotizing. and then there can be pneumoperitoneum ah uh, yes black panther we do have an image of the congenital diaphragmatic hernia coming in so i'll explain there ah uh, duodenal atresia will have double bubble sign right it is uh, you are not seeing the double bubble sign here so this one is basically pneumoperitoneum next question this is a 33 year old female who presents with fever weight loss very very important the history itself is enough the elevated levels of ace levels with hilar lymph adenopathy what is the most probable diagnosis so even if you are not able to identify the image you can still answer this question because the history gives away the answer itself absolutely right that is sarcoidosis 
Increased ACE levels with hilar lymphadenopathy, specifically if I add bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, it is sarcoidosis. And what are you seeing in this radiograph is, look at the bulky hilum, look at the bulky hilum that we have here. So whenever you have bilateral hilar lymph node, always think of sarcoidosis. When I do the gallium scan in this patient, that is the nuclear scan in this patient, what sign does it give on the gallium scan? What sign does it give on the gallium scan then? Yes. On the gallium scan, it gives the lambda sign. Okay, the lymph nodes give the lambda sign or we also get the panda sign. Okay, we also get the panda sign. So we get the lambda sign and the panda sign, another group of lymph node that can be enlarged, which is not seen here, is the right paratracheal lymph node. The sign is called as 1, 2, 3 sign. Okay, we get the 1, 2, 3 sign. So remember, this is sarcoidosis, bilateral hilar lymph node. That is the first stage of sarcoidosis and then it involves the lung parenchyma also. Okay, and where do you see the panda sign on MRI brain, guys? MRI brain, where do you see the face of giant panda sign? It is seen in Wilson's disease. In MRI brain, it is seen in Wilson's disease. The midbrain appears like a face of giant panda. All right, next question. Identify the structure being pointed by the arrow. What arrow are we focusing on? This arrow. Let me mark this arrow because there's a second arrow also. This arrow, tell me what is this structure here marked by the arrow. Right. Absolutely right. That is the portal vein supplying. That is the portal vein supplying the liver. So you can see the structure, horizontal structure, then dividing into the right and the left. So you have the portal vein which divides into the right and the left. So that is the portal vein. Let's have a look at some important structures here. This is the CT scan with the white bone. You can look at this structure. This is the aorta. Right, that's the aorta that we are seeing here. And then look at uh, this vessel here, which you can see that. What is this vessel giving here? This vessel, you can see the splenic artery that will go behind the pancreas. This is the pancreas that you are seeing here. So that is the splenic artery. You have the common hepatic artery. So this is going to be the celiac artery, the branch coming from there, the hepatic artery. What do we have next is to the right of the aorta, this structure that you see here, this is the IVC, right? So this is the IVC. Even this has been asked in the exam. And this is the aorta. And this horizontal structure here, this is the portal vein and this becomes the hepatic artery, right? That becomes the hepatic artery there. And you can see the portal vein basically dividing into the right side. So that image that we had there, that's the portal vein. And here you will have behind the pancreas will be the splenic vein. So remember that what vessels go behind the pancreas? That is the splenic vessels. Is this clear with everyone, the anatomy here? So this one is the portal vein going horizontally. That is the portal vein there. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next question now. Uh, easy one, but very important one. A patient met with RTA is unconscious and the CT scan does not show any findings except for few petechial hemorrhages. What is the probable diagnosis there? So whenever you have this history, a RTA patient, RTA patient unconscious with petechial hemorrhages, it is nothing but diffuse axonal injury. Okay. Tell me that what is the investigation of choice for diffuse axonal injury? The investigation of choice is MRI. What sequence of MRI? It is SWI. Susceptibility weighted imaging is the investigation of choice. Susceptibility weighted imaging is the investigation of choice for diffuse axonal injury. It will show the petechial hemorrhages. What is the staging called as? The Adam staging where you have the involvement of the gray white matter, then the corpus callosum and then the brainstem. Okay. So remember it is diffuse axonal injury. Look at the CT scan here showing those white white dots basically representing the small small hemorrhages. The petechial hemorrhages is what it is representing. Look at the sequence of MRI here. 
Why do I call it MRI? Because of the black bone. Outside the brain parenchyma, you have the black line. So that is MRI. And the black, black areas in this SWI, this is called as areas of blooming, representing hemorrhage on SWI. Okay, so that is the how diffuse external injury will look on the MRI. This is SWI sequence. Okay. Going to the next one, uh, this is a bit of an eccentric question that has been asked in the exam. So let's try to understand this. A patient with prostate cancer receives a sequential radiotherapy at this dose for 5 days every week for 5 to 7 weeks. What is this called as? Is it a regular fractionated radiotherapy? Is it a hypofractionated radiotherapy? Is it a hyperfractionated radiotherapy? Or is it the accelerated radiotherapy? Now let's try to understand these terms and then we will come to this question. So fractionated radiotherapy. What do you mean by fractionated radiotherapy? So let's say a person requires 20 gray of radiation. Instead of giving the 20 gray together, what do we do is we give in fractions. What is the advantage when you give in fractions? Let's say a fraction of 1 gray, 1 gray, 1 gray fraction. So what is the advantage with that is? The normal cells will not be killed because the dose we are decreasing. The normal cells will get time to heal as well. So basically we have some 5 hours of fractionated radiotherapy. Right. So fractionated radiotherapy, the types that we have there. So we have hyperfractionated radiotherapy, hypofractionated, accelerated fractionation and the routine one. So, uh, the, basically the goal of fractionated is minimizing the risk of damage to the surrounding tissues. So, what do we do in hyperfractionated? So, in hyperfractionated, that means you are giving more fractions. So, rather than giving one fraction per day, you give more than once a day fraction. Okay? But the number of, uh, the duration of the treatment is the same as the Standard radiation therapy. That means 4 to 6 weeks to standard is going to In hypofractionated, the number of fractions are less. But the dose in each fraction basically is going to be high. So that is where you will have large doses given once a day. And what do you have in accelerated fractionation? In accelerated matlab, you are giving at an accelerated speed. So that means this is given over a period of few days, let's say five days, six days, rather than giving it over a period of like weeks. So remember that it is the total dose is the same, but the overall treatment is short. So that is what is hyperfractionated, giving more than once a day, but the duration is like four to six weeks. Hypofractionated means large doses is what we give. Large doses is what we give. And accelerated is the duration is in, in um, 5 days or so. Now here the duration of treatment is 5 to 7 weeks. That means this is not the accelerated radiotherapy. Because in accelerated it is over a period of few days itself. Right. Here this is the regular fractionated therapy. This is the regular fractionated therapy. Where the concept is. That you give a dose of approximately 1.82 grays, basically 5 days a week. The weekends are off over the period of 5 to 7 days. Okay, so this is a regular fractionated radiotherapy. We are giving only one dose per day and that is why this is not hyperfractionated. Right, this is not hyperfractionated. The dose is not more like 5 grays, 10 grays and that is why it is not a hypofractionated. So, hypofractionated will have large dose, hyperfractionated will have more fractions per day and you will have uh, accelerated will be few days. That is how you will differentiate the types of fractionated radiotherapy. Is this clear with everyone? Why not hyperfractionated? Because in hyperfractionated, it is more than one fraction per day. Okay, so Moinidin, is that clear? So, in hypofractionated, the dose would be large. In hyperfractionated, more fractions per day. Accelerated radiotherapy means it is not in weeks. It is just in few days. Okay. So, this was, as I said, this is an eccentric question. But this was asked in your exam. And that is why we should know this. So, when you are giving just one one dose over a period of five days in a week. Then Saturday, Sunday is off. Again, you are giving for five days one one dose. In the range of approximately, remember, two gray. 
is the fraction that you are giving, then it is a regular fractionated radiotherapy. Okay. So this was an eccentric question. That's why it took some time to explain you the concept behind it. Because next time they can ask you hyperfractionated, hypofractionated or accelerated radiotherapy. Okay. Going on to the next one. In which of these conditions will you use prophylactic craniospinal irradiation? Prophylactic craniospinal irradiation is done for which cancer? So basically a cancer which I know has very very high chance to spread to the brain and the spinal cord. I will give prophylactic craniospinal irradiation there because I know that there are high chances that this will spread to the brain and the spinal cord. No, that is not the prostate cancer. Which cancer, which lung cancer has a lot of metastasis? It is the small cell lung cancer. It has high chances of metastasis everywhere. So where else do you use prophylactic craniospinal irradiation? You must have read in pediatrics as well. It is ALL. You use in the brain tumors which cause the drop metastasis. Basically the tumors which will drop to the spine like medulloblastoma, penialoblastoma, ependymoma, these drop to the spine, right? ALL and these brain tumors, small cell lung cancer is where we use prophylactic. Tell me what is the first hormone or deficiency that you get after this cranial irradiation? It will affect the pituitary gland also. So what is the first hormone deficiency? It is the growth hormone deficiency is what we get, okay? It is the growth hormone deficiency, right? Going on to the next one. Coming to the easy questions now. Identify the pathology given on the x-ray below. Now because you are seeing the horizontal air fluid level here. The air above the fluid below because it is horizontal. Horizontal means the air and the fluid below. So air and fluid both. This is hydropneumothorax. Why this is not pleural effusion? Why this is not pleural effusion? In pleural effusion, we don't see the horizontal level. It is the LSS curve. So the pleural effusion will go like this. Okay, the pleural effusion will go like this with the lateral aspect more higher. So remember that because of the horizontal level, this is the hydropneumothorax because of the horizontal level. Next one, a 35-year-old female, known case of HIV, CD4 count this much and the chest x-ray is given. What do you think is the diagnosis here? Very good. This is miliary TB here because you can see in the chest radiograph, there are multiple small, small opacities that you are seeing scattered throughout the lung. So, this is miliary TB. Okay, this is miliary TB, suggestive of hematogenous spread of TB. Look at the CT scan. This is how the miliary looks like on CT. You can see the small, small nodules scattered throughout. What kind of nodule distribution do you have in miliary TB? Is it centrilobular? Is it perilymphatic? Is it random? Remember, it is random distribution of nodules. Random distribution of nodules is what we see. Is miliary distribution specific for TB? No, it is not specific for TB. There are multiple other causes of miliary mottling like you have uh, uh, mitrostenosis, pulmonary hemosidrosis, some cancers, the metastasis, they can have miliary appearance. So remember, it's not specific. Silicosis is the occupational lung disease which is similar to TB and even that can have manifestation presentation like TB. Next one, what is the gold standard investigation for FES? What is the gold standard investigation for FES? Functional endoscopic sinus surgery. For paranasal sinuses, basically the investigation that we do is CT scan. CT scan shows the paranasal sinuses anatomy the best. What is that variant in the paranasal sinuses which is infraorbital air cells? Infraorbital large air cell, what is that called as? That is called as Heller cell. What is that posterior ethmoid cell which is related to the optic nerve? Posterior one, ON optic nerve is ONOD cell. Okay, optic nerve is ONOD cell. So remember, these are some, uh, uh, some uh, variations. The anterior most ethmoidal cell, which is in front of the frontal recess, that is called as 
agar nasi cell okay that is called as agar nasi cell next one what do you see here a female visits opd with her 6 week child presenting with vomiting and abdominal pain x ray is shown what is the diagnosis Absolutely right. This is duodenal atresia because what we are seeing here is one bubble and two bubble. So what are we seeing here is the double bubble appearance, right? This is the double bubble appearance which is seen with duodenal atresia. Also remember, annular pancreas can also give the double bubble appearance. So this is double bubble appearance, duodenal atresia, or annular pancreas. Pyloric stenosis will give the single bubble. Stomach obstructed, single bubble. Jejunum, duodenum obstructed, two bubble. Next jejunum obstructed, it will be triple bubble appearance. Okay. And also remember that the vomiting that this patient of duodenal atresia will have, it is going to be bilious vomiting versus CHPS, which will have non-bilious vomiting. Okay. So that is clinical differentiation between the two. Next one, identify the structure marked in the given image. What is the marked structure in the image? Let me zoom this image for you. I hope you can see it now. Very good. Majority of you have got this correct. That is the lentiform nucleus. Let us decode the anatomy here on the CT scan. So look at this one. This is the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. This one here adjacent to the frontal horn is the caudate nucleus. The frontal horns open into the third ventricle which is right in the center, the slit like structure. Adjacent to the third ventricle, the structures that we have, those are the thalamus. Right, lateral to the caudate and the thalamus, we will have the internal capsule there. Okay, we will have the internal capsule there. And lateral to the internal capsule, the structure that you see here, lateral to the internal capsule, that is going to be the lentiform nucleus. Okay, that is going to be the lentiform nucleus. And in the lentiform nucleus, the, the medial part is going to be, the medial part is going to be globus pallidus. The lateral part is going to be putamen. So basically, the medial part will be globus pallidus. The lateral part will be putamen. And both of them together form the lentiform nucleus. Is this clear with everyone? The anatomy there. So what do we have here? This structure which is labeled that is the lentiform nucleus. Okay, that is the lentiform nucleus that we are seeing here. What structure will come here? What structure will come here? So options are, is it going to be the pineal gland, the pituitary gland or the mammillary body? What is the structure that will come here? Pineal, mammillary body or the pituitary? So the structure that I have labeled, uh, okay, the structure that I have labeled is pineal gland ke piche. Okay, the structure that I have labeled is pineal gland ke posterior, uh, sorry, the third ventricle ke piche. Third ventricle ke piche is the pineal gland. So remember that's going to be the pineal gland which is posterior to the third ventricle. Mammillary body, where is the mammillary body located? The heart shaped structure which I told you is the midbrain. Anterior to the midbrain, anterior to the midbrain, you will see the mammillary body. So remember MB, mammillary body is in front of MB, that's the midbrain. Posterior to the third ventricle is the pineal gland. Anterior to the midbrain is the mammillary body. Okay. Going on to the next one, I think this should be an easy one. A patient presents with heart palpable gallbladder with pain in the right hypochondrium. What do you see here? Right, so what are we seeing here? Look at the image here. Look at this and look at the area behind it. This is posterior acoustic shadowing. Shadow is black. Okay, shadow is black. You can see the posterior acoustic shadowing. Actually, there are multiple calculi that you can see here. The posterior acoustic shadowing is suggestive of calculi. This is within the gallbladder. This is the gallbladder that we are seeing here. So this is multiple gallstones. Collate docolithiasis means the stones in the CBD, right? What will be the investigation of choice for the CBD stones? 
for CBD stones, it will be MRCP. Okay, it will be MRCP for the CBD stones. These are the stones in the gallbladder for which the investigation of choice is ultrasound, which is posterior acoustic shadowing. For CBD stones, call it docolithiasis. It's going to be uh, it's going to be MRCP. Okay. Going on to the next one, which arterial territory is involved on the CT image of this patient with a infarct? Which arterial territory do you think is this? Right, this is going to be the MCA territory. Okay, this is going to be the MCA territory. Because first of all, look at the CT scan with the white bone. Look at the pathology here. The pathology here is hypodense. Hypo matlab dark. So this is hypodense as compared to the rest of the brain. Hypodense is infarct. It's a very well defined infarct. This is the MCA territory. The anterior triangular area, this is going to be ACA. And here you will have the posterior will be the PCA. So the larger area of the brain on the lateral aspect that you see, that is the MCA territory, okay? So this is the middle cerebral artery. This is right MCA or is this left MCA? Remember that this is the right side of the patient. This is the left side of the patient. Your left is the patient's right, okay? So this is the right MCA territory and therefore the patient will have presented with left hemiplegia, crossed hemiplegia. That is left hemiplegia is what this patient would have presented with. In PCA territory, in fact, remember it is the visual blindness, the cortical blindness, that will be the complaint. In ACA, in fact, what is the history? Lower limb weakness more than the upper limb weakness, the urinary incontinence is what is the feature. Posterior communicating artery aneurysm compresses which cranial nerve? Remember it is third cranial nerve palsy is what it can lead to. The PCOM aneurysm can lead to the uh, uh, third cranial nerve palsy. Okay, clear with everyone. So this is the MCA territory infarct. What is the first investigation in any patient of stroke? It is non-contra CD. To rule out hemorrhage, to decide that we can do thrombolysis or we cannot do thrombolysis. And then if the NCCT is normal, then we can do the CT angio according to the algorithm to look for the vessel block. And then we can do the MRI that is DWI MRI which shows restricted diffusion in a patient of acute infarct. Okay. Next one. What do you think is the diagnosis here? Is it slip capital femoral epiphysis? Is it perthes? Is it myositis ossificans? Or is this Mayer's dysplasia? Very good. Absolutely right. This is Perthes disease. What is Perthes disease? Perthes disease is basically idiopathic AVN of the femur head in the children. Right? The femur head ka avascular necrosis. And because of that avascular necrosis, the head collapses and it undergoes sclerosis. Remember this point that dead bone on x-ray, is it radiolucent or is it radio-opaque? Dead bone is radio-opaque because it does not undergo resorption. There is no blood supply, so it is radio-opaque. So compare the right femoral head with the left femoral head. This is normal. This is collapsed. This is flat and it has undergone sclerosis. It is more white. And that is why this is AVN. That means this is Perthes disease. Otherwise, the history of AVN in an adult, the general history, a patient on steroids and now presenting with hip pain. Okay, that is the history of AVN that is generally given. Look at the next image here and now tell me what line is this that we are using and to make a diagnosis of which condition. What line is this and why are we using this line basically to make a diagnosis of which condition. Very good. So Raymond, I can see some name Raymond. This is not the Shenton's line guys. This is not the Shenton's line. Any line in the hip or pelvis x-ray is not the Shenton's line. Shenton's line is this one. Okay, this is the Shenton's line where you see the continuity is there. 
uh, okay here you can see the continuity is maintained this is the sentence line so where is what is this line here this line is called as the cleans line okay this is called as the cleans line which is used for diagnosis of slipped capital femoral epiphysis so what is this line is when you draw a line along the lateral aspect of the femur neck it should cross the head of the femur that you are seeing here it should go through the head of the femur on this side what you are seeing is when you are drawing a line along the lateral aspect the head of the femur is medial to it it is not going through the head of the femur so that means that the head of the femur has displaced where is the displacement of the head medially okay where is the displacement it is posterior medial direction displacement so when this is positive that means it is not crossing then it is called as what sign basically this is called as treto one sign okay this is called as treto one sign so this is the slipped capital femoral epiphysis ka diagnosis clean line and treto one sign is what you should remember okay all right let's go to the next one identify the disease shown here is this scurvy is this rickets is it achondroplasia is it osteogenesis imperfecta right so majority of you are saying this is scurvy guys this is not scurvy this is rickets look at the bone look at the bone very prominent can you see the irregular the boundary of the bone is very irregular can you see the fraying there okay there's a fraying there can you see the splaying of the bone that the bone is going like this spreading apart so basically there is the splaying there is this fraying that you are seeing so this is this is rickets where you see splaying cupping and fraying okay where you see splaying fraying and cupping is what you see let me show you another image here this is image asked in one of the recent uh, neat pg exam also what are you seeing here the bowing of the legs what are you seeing here is the bowing of the legs which is called as genu valgus or genu varum it is genu varum and this is also seen in rickets the bowing of the legs that is genu varum is seen in rickets now look at this image this is the image of scurvy okay this is the image of scurvy look at the epiphysis very very important look at the epiphysis which is appearing like a ring just the cortex is seen this is called as wimberger's ring okay this is called as wimberger's ring is what it is called as look at this one the white line of frankel and adjacent to that the black area that is the tremor field zone look at the spur like thing which is called as pelkin spur okay that is called as pelkin spur so all these findings are basically tells you that this is scurvy okay this is scurvy uh ta have the difference between osteoporosis and osteopenia is basically the bone mineral density between minus 1 to minus 2.5 standard deviation it is osteopenia less than beyond minus 2.5 it is called as osteoporosis so basically it's the bone mineral density ka difference right so look at the image the most important that you should be looking at is look at this epiphysis you are not seeing the ring appearance so this is not scurvy look at uh, this epiphysis here it looks like a ring so it is scurvy you can see the white line of frankel which is not seen in active rickets you can see the tremor field zone okay and what do you see in achondroplasia remember ch ch achondroplasia shows champagne glass pelvis it shows champagne glass pelvis it shows a trident hand right the different the spread spreading of the middle and the ring fingers going on to the next question here some of you you know one of you were asking about this a 6 day old neonate having respiratory distress what is the diagnosis this is congenital diaphragmatic hernia right what are you seeing here look at all these small bowel loops which have herniated into the hemithorax and you can see the mediastinal shift to the right side what is the worst prognostic factor in congenital diaphragmatic hernia it is the development of pulmonary hypoplasia if there is development of pulmonary hypoplasia 
that is the worst prognostic factor in congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Okay, so that is congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Where you see this lucent, lucent, basically the air containing small bowel loops which have gone here upwards. Okay, that is congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Going to the next one, identify the diagnosis on imaging as shown below. So these multiple cystic cystic spaces, basically this is the snowstorm appearance. Okay, this is the snowstorm appearance of Hyder TD4 mole complete or incomplete. This is suggestive of complete molar pregnancy. Okay, this is not PCOD guys. This is the uterus showing the uh, cystic spaces in PCOS, the follicles will be in the periphery, the necklace sign or the string of pearls sign. Okay. In incomplete mole, you would see some fetal parts that will be present in incomplete mole. Next one. A patient with history of TB and prolonged back pain, what is the diagnosis? A patient with history of TB and prolonged back pain. First of all, tell me what is this? Is it a CT or is it a MRI? This one is CT or MRI. Look at the bone here. The bone cortex is appearing black. This is MRI. And in the MRI, in the paravertebral position, you are seeing the psoas abscess. This is where you will see the psoas muscle in the paravertebral location. So this is basically the psoas abscess. The collection in the psoas muscle. TB is known to cause psoas abscess. Right? The patient will present with flexion deformity of the hip. Next one, the given uh, skull x-ray finding is seen in, what is the skull x-ray finding that we are seeing here? Basically, the skull x-ray finding that we are seeing here is the hair on end appearance. What finding are we seeing here? This is hair on end appearance, which is basically seen with hemolytic anemia. It could be thalassemia, it could be sickle cell anemia, it could be G6PD deficiency, any hemolytic anemia, okay? So remember, this is the hair on end appearance seen with, this is also called as crew cut appearance. Okay, this is also called as crew cut appearance. Next one, identify the pathology on the given barium enema image. Multiple myeloma sahira will basically have punched out lytic lesions. It will have punched out lytic lesions in the x-ray skull. You would see the almost the same size lytic lesions. Yeah, very good. This is intersusception because what are you seeing here? Look at the barium enema, the barium coming here and then the barium has become like a claw. So what are we seeing here is the claw sign is what we are seeing here. Look at the appearance like claw of the barium. This is the claw sign of intersusception. So when the barium goes up, it forms a claw around the intersusceptor. Another sign that we can see in intersusception is the coil spring sign. What is the history? Generally, the history is of red current jelly stools and, uh, and uh, the immediate management is going to be pneumatic reduction. The immediate management in this case is going to be pneumatic reduction, right? So, this is intersusception, okay? Coming on to the next one, a 45-year-old female came for post-surgery follow-up. A chest x-ray was taken. What is the most likely diagnosis? Yes, very good. This is left-sided mastectomy. So look at the image here. You can see the right-sided breast shadow here. You don't see the left-sided breast shadow. Compare the left side as compared to the right side. This is appearing more darker. Why is the left side appearing more darker as compared to the right side? Because of the mastectomy done here. Right. So when the mastectomy is done, you are removing the breast tissue overlying the chest. So, you are decreasing the density through which the x-rays have to pass. So, when the mastectomy is done, the x-ray penetration will be more. Okay, the x-ray penetration will be more. And whenever the x-ray penetration is more, the structure appears black. Okay, the structure appears black. So, remember that it is left-sided mastectomy appearing more black because of the decreased density. Okay, because of the decreased density. So, this is where you don't see the breast shadow. Identify the given HSG image. Is it bicornuate, unicornuate, septate or didelphus?
Very good. This is a unicornuate uterus. Unicornuate uterus means out of the two Mullerian ducts, only one duct has developed. So the uterus will be deviated to one side. And you can see the uterus which is deviated to one side. That means a single horn with the fallopian tube here. Right. This is the cannula here. The contrast going up. So this is the deviated uterus, the uterus deviated to one side, appearing like a banana. This is called as banana uterus. Okay, this is seen with unicornuate uterus. What is the gold standard investigation for uterine anomalies? It is hysteroscopy plus laparoscopy. What is the best non-invasive investigation for uterine anomalies? It is, uh, it is MRI. Okay, it is MRI, which is the best non-invasive investigation. Next one, a female patient with dysphagia in the barium swallow is shown. What is the likely diagnosis? Yes, absolutely right. You can see this narrowing in the lower part of the esophagus, giving this appearance which is called as the bird beak appearance. Very, very important. This is the bird beak appearance of echelasia cardia. Okay, this is the bird beak appearance. What is the gold standard for echelasia cardia? It is manometry. Measuring the LES pressure, manometry is the gold standard. How do you differentiate it from cancer? The dysphagia is more to liquids or the dysphagia is more to solids. In echelasia, the dysphagia is more to liquids. Because with the solids, the solids coming with their weight, they open the LES. The liquids will not cause a lot of pressure. So the dysphagia is more to liquids. Okay, so this is achalasia. In diffuse esophageal spasm, we have corkscrew esophagus appearance. We have corkscrew esophagus, which is there. In esophageal cancer, we have the appearance of shouldering or also called as the apple core appearance, which is seen with cancer. Okay, next one. This is a 65-year-old female who fell down in the bathroom and sustained a head injury. CT scan is done. What is the diagnosis? So one hemorrhage in the CT brain is very, very important. Pneumothorax, pneumoperitoneum, these are the most important images for your exam. This, guys, is not extradural or this is not subarachnoid. This is the subdural hemorrhage because look at the shape of the hemorrhage here. Okay, look at the shape of the hemorrhage here. Look at this hemorrhage. This entire thing is the hemorrhage. What is the shape of the hemorrhage here? It is sickle shape hemorrhage. Remember sickle shape of hemorrhage? S for S is STH. STH crosses the sutures. You can see that it is going around the entire hemisphere telling you that this is crossing the sutures and it is because of the rupture of the cortical bridging veins. Okay, it is because of the rupture of the cortical bridging veins. Extradural hemorrhage on the other side is idly shaped. That means it is biconvex shape. It does not cross the sutures. Okay, it does not cross the sutures. So this is SGH. Next one, identify the given IVP image. I'll zoom in this image for you. Look at this image and tell me what do you see here? Identify the given IVP image. Our Black Panther, the majority of the images are being covered here in this uh, session. I would not say like, yeah, this is like all 100%, but uh, yes, 90% approximately is what is being covered here. Absolutely right. What do you see here is the cobra head appearance, the cobra head appearance of the ureters. And where do you see the cobra head appearance? With the ureter ocele. So when the ureter goes and inserts into the bladder, it forms a cobra head appearance. Because of the dilatation, this is called as cobra head or adder head appearance of the ureterocele. Okay, so this is cobra head. What are you seeing here in this IVP image? This has also been asked in the image in the exam. So the two kidneys which you can see are coming towards the vertebra telling you that this is the horseshoe kidney. The appearance is called as flower vase appearance or the joining hands appearance. The same thing you can see in the CT scan also, that is the horseshoe kidney. Remember the association with Turner syndrome. Remember the association of horseshoe with Turner syndrome. Now let's have a look at some more images because renal is very, very important and being asked frequently in the exam. What do you think is the diagnosis in the first image? 
So in the first image, this is the IVP where you see this uh, contrast in the kidney and the ureter and in the bladder. On the right side, you see the dilated pelvic calicial system that is hydronephrosis without the ureter being seen. So remember the first one is not the putty kidney, this is the PUJ obstruction. Uh, the question will tell you that this is a delayed IVP image and even on the delayed image you are not seeing, you are not seeing the uh, ureter, right. So this is the pelvis which is dilated, these are the calices which are dilated. So basically there will be hydronephrosis without a hydrourator in PUJ obstruction because the ureter is not dilated. Okay, so this is going to be PUJ obstruction. Look at the next image. What do you think is the diagnosis in this image? What do you think is the diagnosis in this image? Okay, before we go to the diagnosis, tell me what investigation is this? Do you think this is IVP, this is RGU, this is RGP, this is MCU? What do you think is uh, this image here? What investigation is this? Very good. Medical VH, absolutely right. This is micturating cystourethrogram, guys. This is not RGU. Because in RGU, that is retrograde urethrogram, we just cannulate the external urethral orifice. We see the contrast into the urethra and some part into the bladder. Here, the bladder is distended with contrast, entirely distended with contrast. And you see the urethra also here. So, this is micturating cystourethrogram. What is the abnormality in this micturating cystourethrogram? Should you normally see the ureter and the kidney in MCU? When the bladder is contracting, there should be no reflux. If you are seeing the contrast in the ureter and the kidney, in MCU, it is suggestive of VUR. So here you can see the contrast into the ureter and the kidney. You can see the contrast going into the ureter and the kidney. So the diagnosis here is VUR, where you are seeing the contrast in the ureter and the kidney in MCU. I hope this is clear with everyone. What history do you have in a patient of VUR? VUR history would be the history of child with recurrent UTI. That is what will be the history in VUR. A child with recurrent UTI. Right. And what is going to be the investigation of choice? The investigation of choice will be MCU. Okay. Going on to the next one. Now this is a normal x-ray abdomen. And remember that what are you seeing here is the calcified kidney here. This is not a staghorn calculus. The staghorn calculus will have a shape like this. This is the parenchyma of the kidney which is calcified. This is called as putty kidney. Okay, this is called as putty kidney which is generally unilateral seen in patients of TB. And the history that you have here is sterile pyuria. What history do you have here is? The history of sterile pyuria is generally given. So remember the lobulated appearance is what you will see with the Putty kidney. Okay, that's a putty kidney history of TB. Okay, it is seen with TB. Coming to the next one, the previously asked question, what is this arrow pointing towards? What structure is the arrow pointing to? Is it the medial epicondyle? Is it the trochlea? Is it the capitulum? Or is it the olecranon? Very good. Very good, Dr. Devya Dhruva. Uh, correct. This is basically capitulum. Now, what is capitulum? Capitulum is the part of the humerus adjacent to the radius head. That is what is capitulum. The part of the humerus adjacent to the radius head. So, look at this elbow x-ray that you are seeing here. This is the radius head, the radius which is ending there. This is the ulna which goes up. So, how do you identify radius and ulna? Ulna ka olecranon goes up. The part of the humerus adjacent to the radius that is called as capitulum. So now can you tell me that this epicondyle that you are seeing here, is it the medial epicondyle or is it the lateral epicondyle? Is that medial epicondyle or lateral epicondyle? So adjacent to the ulna. Ulna is the medial bone and that is why this becomes your medial epicondyle. This one will be your lateral epicondyle. This one will be your lateral epicondyle. Right. And uh, what is the first ossification center that appears in the elbow? 
out of all of these which is the first ossification center remember the mnemonic is crito so crito means the first is the capital m e means the external epicondyle that is the lateral epicondyle is the last right so remember capital m is the first and the lateral epicondyle is the last okay going on to the next one identify the given chest radiograph look at the image here i'll zoom in this image for you what do you think is this image showing very good absolutely right correct this is pneumothorax what sided pneumothorax is it the right sided pneumothorax okay this is the right sided pneumothorax look at the visceral pleural line that's the lunca margin that you can see and surrounding that this everything there surrounding that is the air without a vascular markings you don't see any vascular markings here so it is pneumothorax okay so it is pneumothorax there if it is tension pneumothorax patient is unstable then we will do the needle puncture in the fifth intercostal space and then we will put the icd if it's a non tension then we will just tape the hole right and in the ultrasound what sign we see with pneumothorax is the barcode or the stratosphere sign okay we see the barcode or the stratosphere sign with pneumothorax going on to next one patient with right hypochondrial pain water lily sign is seen on the ultrasound what is the diagnosis Yes, absolutely right. That is a hydatid cyst. So, water lily sign basically indicates in the cyst there is the membrane of floating, suggestive of the water lily sign. Look at the image here. This is the ultrasound, which is showing a cystic lesion. How do I know that this is a cystic lesion? Because it is completely black. It is anechoic, and inside that lesion, I can see the membrane floating. So, this is the water lily sign okay this is the water lily sign right you have the gerbes classification there look at the water lily sign on the chest radiograph so this is the lesion here and you have the black air above the fluid below and overlying the fluid you can see some membranes floating okay so that is the water lily sign on chest x ray so water lily sign on ultrasound on ct on x ray is what you can see Remember that the last stage of uh, hydatid is the calcified lesion. Calcified hydatid in the liver. In the lung, it does not calcify. Hydatid in the lung does not calcify. Okay? Right. So, yes, uh, I, I believe that uh, that completes our uh, discussion of the previous year questions asked in the recent years. I've tried to touch almost all the important areas. So please make sure that you revise this. I'll, I'll share this PDF on my Telegram group as well so that it's handy for you to revise in the end. So I hope all of you have enjoyed the session and learned some important points about the black and white of radiology. So thank you so much everyone for joining in. And yes, please do subscribe to this channel so that you do not miss any of the upcoming sessions. We are doing the FMG flashback for all the subjects. Okay. So, thank you so much everyone. There's no schedule as yes, uh, radiology technologists for the live sessions. We have, I have the recorded classes of radiology on the Prep Ladder app. Okay. Thank you so much everyone and goodbye. Take care and keep studying, keep revising and keep winning. Thank you so much.